Welcome to Inner Guidance Channel, where imagination shapes reality. Join us as we dive deep into the profound teachings found within Neville Goddard's rare books and lectures, all available for free right here on our channel. Today, we proudly present his remarkable lecture, The Power of Faith, in his own voice, with enhanced audio quality through AI technology. So sit back, relax, and prepare to unlock the secrets of manifestation and transformation with us today. Tonight's subject is the power of faith. The most important Hebrew term for the word faith is Amen, which signifies firmness, stability, but its precise meaning is hold God trustworthy, to hold God trustworthy. And tonight I hope to be able to share with you what I have discovered about this fabulous power that is faith. First, let us define faith as defined for us in the book of Hebrews. This unknown author, some claim that Paul wrote it, but the majority of the scholars are not convinced. They feel it is not quite his terminology unless he radically changed when he wrote this book. So it's an unknown author, one of the most profound books in the Bible. In the 11th chapter, it is stated, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By it, men of old received divine approval. We understand that by faith, the world was created by the word of God, so that things that are seen were made out of things which do not appear, verses one to three. Then comes the assemblage of witnesses. He first assembles seven, beginning with Abel. And then he summarizes this compound witness. And then he mentions another 11. Then he summarizes it again. But here in this statement, speaking now of God, for when we speak of faith, simply to hold God trustworthy, God becomes the object of one's faith. So here, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Anyone who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Now, the best way to understand this is through a little story. A minister was calling at a home to make arrangements for the funeral of an elderly man. Although he was not a professing Christian, he was highly regarded in his community. His widow, trying to persuade the clergyman of her husband's goodness, said to him, Henry was a believer. He believed that God is. He's a believer. He believed that there is a God. Now she herself would never accept this definition of faith if it was applied by Henry to her. Suppose, for instance, during their married life, she had asked Henry, Henry, do you believe in me? And suppose he answered, yes, Mary, I believe that you exist. Would she be satisfied with that? So it's more than believing that God exists. So listen to the sentence carefully. People read just a little portion of it and they cut off the important part of that verse. This is the 11th chapter, the sixth verse of Hebrews. You not only must believe that God exists, but that he rewards those who seek him. The existence in itself is not enough. There must be an activity. How could I know? I believe this exists table, but I expect nothing more from it than to hold paper and pencils and anything I should put on it. That's not what I expect of God. So I believe that God exists, but I must also believe that he rewards me if I seek him. So God acts, I must react. God speaks and I must say amen to that. Well now, tonight I want something for myself or for a friend. How would I go about seeking God, having God act and I react? So I think of my friend and I see on my friend's face an expression which implies that they have what I want them to have. I see it right on their face. I listen as though we spoke to each other and he or she, they are telling me what I want to hear. You may say, well, that's not God acting, that's Neville acting. I say to you, I am doing it. And you will say, yes, I know you were doing it. I say, no, I am doing it. 
What is his name? I am. Has he any other name? Oh, many names. His name is Father. Call him Lord. Call him God. Call him by every name. But the name he revealed to man, which must be a name forever and forever for all generations, is I am. X 3 Corn 14. So I am bringing before my mind's eye the face of a friend. And I put on that face an expression implying the fulfillment of my desire for them. And so God is acting. I'm not separating God from myself, for his name is I am. And so I bring it so. Am I going to react now? I must now react to God's action. God acted. I'm quite familiar with the action, but it's God that is acting. For God only acts and is in all existing beings and men. So he dwells in me as my own wonderful human imagination. I know what I imagine. Well, that's God. To believe in God is one thing, but to believe that he rewards me if I seek him is another thing. And that's where men stop, like Henry stopped. For Henry was a good man. Henry believed that there is a God, and she thought that would pacify the minister. And maybe it did, for you could get from some communist this night his belief, his confession of faith. And he said, I believe there is a God. If you want all people to believe in God, you may be satisfied. That's not good enough. I must not only believe there's a God, I must believe that he rewards me if I seek him and then put him to the test. Now, I ask everyone here to put him to the test. I put him to the test. I put him to the test daily. He does not fail. If it seems long as far as I'm concerned, I know it is not long for what I've asked. At that moment, that was the beginning of an action, and the action will fulfill itself in its own good time. I'm called upon to be patient, to be faithful, and simply await God's production. He's going to produce it. All I'm asked to do is to simply let God act. Well, God acted. I sit here tonight for the next half an hour, three quarters of an hour. I will sit in the silence and bring before my mind's eye some friend who is here and carry on a simple conversation with him. God acted. So when I rise from there, did I react in confidence, in absolute faith? The opposite of faith is worry. Am I going to be concerned about results? Am I going to ask myself, how is it going to happen? Well, then I'm worrying. Now listen to these words from the fourth chapter. The sixth verse of Philippians, have no anxiety, whatever. The words are, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, or let all your requests be made known to God. Have no anxiety about anything. So you ask something, you say, well, the doctor said so-and-so. Well, I don't care what the doctor said. Well, the boss said so-and-so. I don't care what he said. I am told, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let all of your requests be made known to God. So you sit quietly, and now you're going to commune with God. Wait for God to tell you something? Don't you know who God is? How must I wait for God to tell me something? God is speaking to me every time I use my imagination. For God is all imagination and dwells in me as my imagination. So I think of a friend. As I conjure him before my mind's eye, I represent him to myself as I want to see him. That's God's action. Now I must react. I've come to him and God would now reward me if I seek him. Well, I sought him and I found exactly what he's going to give me. For the expression on the face of a friend implies the fulfillment of what I want for them. Or, if the expression is not enough, I listen as though I heard words that I would hear and could only hear if things were as they want them to be. And so, I listen just as though it were true. And then I must not worry, for that is then the opposite of faith. And by faith, all things were made. Without it, he didn't make anything. 
and how did he make it? He made all the visible things that I see out of invisible states. Now listen to these words from the fourth chapter, the 17th verse of Romans. And he calls a thing that is not seen as though it were seen and the unseen becomes seen. He calls a thing that is not seen as though it were seen and then the unseen becomes seen. So I bring your face before me. All right, I can see your face. Then I put the expression on it. I see that, but I don't see what it is implying. No one sees that. I can see your face, but what does it imply? It implies the fulfillment of your dream come true, all come true. But I don't see it. I only see that which it implies. Now I get the secret of God's creativity. He acts in this manner. I have found him, by him all things are made. Without him was not made anything that is made. And I just did it. All right, a lady comes to see me. I do not know her from a hole in the wall. She said, I had been recommended to you and I do not understand what you do. Well, I said, I just do nothing. You sit right there and I will sit here. And you imagine that you are telling me you have found the lady that you are seeking. This was her request. I haven't seen a friend of mine in over a year and I'm anxious to see her. Now, what must I do? I said, you sit there and you tell me mentally, don't scream at me. Just simply tell me mentally that you have found her. I will sit just where I am. I will imagine that you are talking to me and you're telling me you've found her. So when I say, that's enough or that's okay, we'll break the little mental conversation and that's all that I will do. So she sat quietly for five minutes. I sat quietly for five minutes. I imagine she's talking to me and she's telling me she's found her. At the end of five minutes, I got up and said, thank you so much. She said, is that all? I said, that's all. Well, she wasn't at all convinced. She walked through the door. She'd never seen me before. And so that was all. She could have told me within the week that she found her, but she didn't. She waited. And this is what happened. She inquired where her friend last was seen, and they said to her she went off to Hartford, Connecticut. So she took a train to Hartford. She was having no faith whatsoever in what we did, because to her that was the height of stupidity. Off she went to Hartford. When she got there, they said, yes, we know her, but she left for Boston. So off to Boston she goes. At the address in Boston, yes, they knew her. She lived here, this was her address but she left here without leaving any forwarding address, and that's several months ago. So she returns to New York City. One day on 14th Street, shopping at Hearn's department store, she's walking by on the south side of the street. You come out of Hearn's on 14th Street, Union Square. Had she been five seconds early or late, they would have missed each other because she was right on the button. They ran right into each other on 14th Street, right opposite coming out of Hearn's department store. How could you possibly have arranged it? She could not possibly have arranged it. She went to Hartford to spend her good money and time, Boston, her money and time, and returned disappointed. But we had planted the seed. I did not know how she would ever know that this person, all right, so she found her. She's walking down 14th Street. And all of a sudden, they bump right into each other in front of Hearn's department store. That's how it works. I could sit down and burst all the blood vessels of my brain, trying to figure out for her what she should do. You don't do anything. God acts and man reacts. God speaks and we say, Amen. Amen is holding God trustworthy. That was his action. You act. I know I acted. Well, that's God. Is it arrogant? It's your own wonderful human imagination. That's God. God actually became man that man may become God. And how did he become man? By sinking himself in man as man's own wonderful human imagination. That's God. He so loved man, he became man. And in man, can't you say I am? Well, that's his name. He has no other name, really. He does have fatherhood. That's the greatest name in the world. But that comes at the very end. 
Long before the Son appears and calls you Father, you will use the name called I Am. Only in the very end are you called Father. I tell you that you're Father, but it has to be revealed to you personally for you to know it. You must experience fatherhood, and only the Son can make you experience it. Until that day comes, use the name he gave us, for that same name will be forever and forever. This is my name for all generations, forever and forever. And the name is I am. So I sit down quietly and I think of someone. At that very moment, they may not respond. I may not hear from them. But do you know that at that moment, in some strange way, they thought of me? They may never sit down and write a letter and tell me, at this very moment, I was thinking about you. But they had to. They're all in me. So you bring someone up and you simply bring them before your mind's eye and you bless them. In what way? God blesses them because God acts. You bring them into your mind's eye and you see them as you want to see them. One who is happy, gainfully employed. Things are just right. He could not ask at this moment in time, for something lovelier. So you ask it for him, and then you see his face reflecting the fulfillment of that request. Make all of your requests known to God. Well, God knows it. Don't I know it? Well, that's he. My own imagination knows it. Well, that's God. God is my imagination. He's your imagination. So when you know that, you do it wisely from morning to night. Let me paraphrase that wonderful 13th chapter of Corinthians for you. It's the one on love. But now we'll take it and paraphrase it on faith. For you know the very last verse which was asked me. And you've read it. What is the greatest thing in the world? And you answer, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Verse 13. With that, I agree. Love is the greatest in the world. But in that trio, faith is mentioned. Faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest, but faith is there. And these three abide. So we now paraphrase it. Though I speak in the tongues of men and angels, though I have all the prophetic powers of the world, so that I know all the mysteries and understand all knowledge, though I give all that I have away, and though I give my body to be burned and have not faith, I cannot please him. I said love. I should say I am as nothing. Without love, you are as nothing. But faith, without faith, I cannot please him. Those who come to him must know that he exists. But before that is stated, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if I gave all that I had, Suppose that I had all the wealth of the world and I gave it to the poor. Suppose I offered my body to be burned while still living in it, as many Buddhists have done recently. Suppose I was so wise that I had all the prophetic powers of the world, that I could see tomorrow and play the game today based upon tomorrow and knowing tomorrow's quotation on the market. If I knew exactly every horse that would win tomorrow, I was so prophetic I know every horse that's going to come in, and I knew it today. All I'd have to do is call my bookie, if I had one, have him go out and just simply bring the money back. I know it all. But suppose I knew all these things and had not faith, I could not please him. He can't be pleased in any way save through faith. So he calls upon man who is completely shut out from the next second. He can't know exactly what's going to happen five minutes from now because this body is a veil that blinds the being that he really is. For man is really God awakening. So God blinds himself with the garment of flesh and with this blind upon him, he has to live by faith. So we walk by faith, not by sight, we're told. Now, can I walk by faith? All right, I think of someone I don't have to sit down and really work it out. I don't consider the ways and means. You're told, I have ways and means you know not of. 
My ways are past finding out. Rom 1133, KJV. If they're past finding out, what am I doing? Trying to unravel the ways by which I will realize my objective? So when this lady left my room, she thought, well now, this is the height of insanity. They told me to go and see this man. He seemed a normal person, but that isn't normal. So she goes through the door and the whole thing seemed to her a complete waste of her time. Yet a week later, after her visit to one place, another city, and back disappointed, she runs into her. How could you ever have arranged it? A lady came to see me after completely exhausting all the things in New York City. She went to the police department first, then she went to the detective agency and paid a goodly price to find the furniture that had disappeared while she was in Europe for almost a year with her children. She left her furniture and her apartment. She was paying the rent every month, and yet when she came back, there was no furniture. So she sought the help of the police department. She sought the help of the private agency, and they couldn't locate it in all of the things that they did in New York City. They went to the five boroughs, going to all the great storehouses, and they couldn't find any evidence of it. Then she came to me. She knew me well. She could have come first and saved herself time and money. Another word used, which is not often used, but it's always translated truth, and that is emeth, aleph, mem, tof. That's translated truth. Well, what is a true judgment? Now this is called faith. A true judgment, said the world of Caesar, must conform to the external reality to which it relates. That's what Caesar said. I say, isn't that a wonderful plant? And you say, what plant? Now he's really gone. So there's a marvelous plant and not one sees a plant, but I am seeing a plant, a lovely plant. And so, that's a false judgment, for it does not conform to the external fact to which my judgment relates. There is no plant, so that's a lie. So the word faith, which is emeth in another way, is truth. So that's not true. But I still say I see a plant. And I live in the assumption that that was an act. God acted. All things are possible to God. And so, in my imagination, I saw a plant. Who saw it? Well, God acted. Can I accept it? Can I react? For God acts and I'm called upon to react. God speaks and I'm called upon to say amen to what he said. So can I say amen to that, that there's a plant there? If I can say amen to it, well, then it's done. And in no time and in a way I do not know and could not devise, someone's going to bring a plant. But they will say, but someone brought it. It didn't grow out of the piano. Did I tell you it's coming out of the piano? They want me to bring it out of something. Back in New York City, I said, imagining creates reality. This professor, he teaches in some Eastern college. And he said to me, imagining creates reality? Well, here is pencil. Neville, it's a yellow pencil. Make it red. I said, go and paint it. Paint the pencil. Go in the back room and paint it red. You can make it red. No, you make it red. Did I tell you I'm gonna make anything? I said everything is possible to imagination. I can imagine it red, but it isn't red. To you it isn't, I said, but it's red to me. I say it's red, and tomorrow maybe you'll lose this pencil and find one just like it and you're going to find a red one. You go back to your college and teach them all your little things that you know concerning what Aristotle said, what Plato said, what all the others who are blind said. I am telling you only about the Bible. And the Bible tells me whatever I believe comes to pass, if I can believe it. Whatever I ask in prayer believing, the same comes to pass. Mark 11:42. Well, can I believe it when reason denies it and my senses deny it? 
Can I give my belief sensory vividness and give it all the tones of reality? Well, certainly I can. I do it. I've gone all over this world when they told me I couldn't go, when I had no permission even to travel, no permission to travel from this country, or permission to get back into this country. I went out of the country and came back into the country by putting myself just where I wanted to be if it were true that I am there. And so, what's his name? I am. Well, can't I say I am? Well, is there anything impossible to God? Nothing. But man has to make that answer. Man may say, oh yeah, he can't grow a second foot if one is severed. So right away, they think God can't do that. He can make me. He's already made four billion pairs walking the earth now, but he can't make another one. So he's made billions of pairs of eyes, but he can't make another one. Not one single eye that you gouge out. He's done all these things, but he can't make another one. And may I tell you, he can. I had that experience. I was lifted up on high and saw this fabulous world of imperfection, blind, lame, halt, withered, shrunken. And just as I was lifted up, and I did nothing. As I walked by, everything was molded into perfection. As I walked by, eyes that were missing came out of some strange place and molded themselves in the empty sockets. Arms that were missing came out of some strange reservoir and they came back and molded themselves into the empty sockets. And everyone was made perfect. When I got to the very last, this heavenly chorus sang out, it is finished. Then I came back to this limitation where I must live by faith, but I saw it. Now, having seen another aspect of the power which will be yours and mine tomorrow, for I tasted of the power of the age to be, where this whole vast world, if you took the human body with its billions of atoms and then fragmented it and each becomes a man. So, if this whole vast world, just as God in this lady, could take mankind and rearrange it to bring about the maid at the corner, rearrange the entire structure to produce the maid who knows where the furniture is. Well, someone is ill, can't he also rearrange the structure of the body in the twinkle of an eye? He arranged the structure of the macrocosm. Can he not rearrange the structure of the microcosm? And so, who did it? All you do is simply act in your imagination. You imagine that things are as you would like them to be, and they will react. The imaginal act was God. Don't say it was Bob doing it, and John doing it, and Mary doing it. All right, it was God doing it. Now let John and Mary and Bob react. And so, I react with pleasure. So you are told, let me quote for you again, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse of Philippians, have no anxiety about anything. What a statement. But in everything by prayer, with supplication, and with thanksgiving, let all your requests be made known to God. No anxiety about anything. Now comes letting your request be known to God. Well, my request is that John has a wonderful job, gainfully employed and moving up, expanding, month after month. So I meet John in my mind's eye now, and John tells me he has the most wonderful job in the world. Well, that action was God. And so he tells me, I react, I say, amen to that. The whole thing is done. I go to the end, and then I don't raise a finger to get John the job. I don't call a friend and say, you know John is in need of a job, can you help him out and steer him in the right direction? I do nothing. I can't put my hand upon that ark and steer at all. Let it be steered properly by the imaginal act, for the imaginal act contains within itself the power and the wisdom to externalize itself. So I can't do a thing about it. All I'm called upon to do is simply to react to God's action. But I know who God is. I have found him. Because if by him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made, I know exactly what I did. I recall exactly 
sitting with that lady in her imaginary wonderful room, sitting on her own furniture. That's all that I did. If she found it in this strange, unique manner, I know that I didn't aid her in the finding. I only sat on the furniture. If I'm sitting in her place on the furniture, and then it happens that the furniture comes in that place, and I'm invited there for tea, and I do go and sit on that furniture, I know what I did. Now I'm told, by him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. Well, I know what I did. So I have found him. I have found exactly who he is. He's my imagination. My imagination in action is God creating. And when I can react to that imaginal act and say amen to it, well then I know exactly what is meant in the Bible. He is the yea to everything. He simply said yes to every imaginal act that takes place within him, confident that his father who is himself can externalize it. On this level, when I'm veiled, I am shut out. When the veil is taken off, I am one with the father in the true sense of the word. We aren't then too. And then you'll understand this fabulous mystery. I came out of this, and therefore that which comes out of this is its son, and this is its father. But that which comes out has been promised to be the father of this. Well, that's a fantastic thing. You mean I mature and I awake when I become my own father's father? Yes, I come out of this and therefore this is its father. I awoke in this and this is David. David is the sum total of all the generations of humanity fused into a single being that is a youth called David. But every being is David. When fused, it's David. But individually, it's David. So that body is David. So I awoke in this body and I know who I am. To you who may not understand it, when I say I awoke in my skull, don't think I was a little tiny thing this big, you know? I'm just as big as I am, and my skull, if I drew a straight line here, the skull is equal to the size of this area here, because I stood up and walked around in my skull. The skull was just as big as this area here. All things being relative, I wasn't any little tiny thing this big, I was the man that I am now, feeling myself just as I am now. So I stood up and walked around in the skull, the skull, the size of this room. Then I came out. I woke in my own being, for this is David. I come out of David. And then five months later, David, the sum total of all humanity, stands before me and calls me father. So man matures when he becomes his own father's father, for this gave birth to it. I slept in it and woke in it. And then you'll understand the words, when your days are fulfilled, which means when you're dead. That's a lovely way of putting it. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, that means when you're buried with the rest of them, then I will raise up your son after you who shall come forth from your body. Out from your body, I will be his father. Who is speaking? God is speaking, and he shall be my son. So I'm raising up out of David the body, my own son. But he comes out of the body. Therefore, the body is its father. So he comes out of David. Now listen to these words, Jesus Christ. This is from the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended from David. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descended from David, blessed forever, 2, 8. Descended from David, you come out of this body, and therefore this that gave birth to it must be your father. And in spite of that, suddenly he appears before you and calls you father. So I say, maturity comes to man when man, born of David, becomes David's father. So you're actually matured when you become your own father's father, and the father's father is God. But while you are here in this world wearing this garment of flesh, you must walk by faith and understand why you must walk by faith and why you must react to God's action. God's action is your own wonderful imaginal act. That's God's action. So learn to discriminate and only act in noble manners. So you want to be successful? Why not? You want your friends to be successful? 
Why not? You want all the fellows that you know to be happy and successful? Why not? Well, then act in that way and say amen to it. Learn to say amen to your imaginal acts and then don't raise a finger to make it so. Let it be so. And don't justify failure, but wait patiently. Simply let it be known to God. Let all your requests be known to God. And you're known to God because I know what I did. That's being known to God. How could I know something and the presence men call God not know it if he's God? Well, is he all knowing? Well, he knows what I imagined because he imagined it because he is my imagination. God became man. That man may become God. So now, this very moment, without any bursting of blood vessels, you simply think of someone and see them as you would like to see them, gainfully employed, if that's the problem of the moment. If it's health, that you've never seen them look better, and they'll say, never felt better. All right, that's all that you do. Say yes, say amen to that imaginal act. Don't go home and call them up to see if it's working. Just leave it alone. And in a wonderful manner that you do not know, they will make it visible for you. They'll either call you, write you, or some third party will say, you know what? I read it in so-and-so, and you should see them. And then they will bring the good news. So it doesn't matter how it happens, it will happen. So don't go into any palaver. I went to New York City two years ago, as I go year after year. I called a friend I hadn't seen in quite a while. And so I went up and I said, is Mr. So-and-so in, Mr. X? And she corrected me, oh, you mean Dr. So-and-so? All right, Dr. So-and-so. When I knew him, he was not Dr. So-and-so, but now he has a little degree, not a medical doctor. She said, he's busy. I said, well, I'll wait. Well, he's giving a treatment, and there are others waiting for treatments when he's through. All right, I'll wait. Then I heard a voice coming through the door. Infinite mind is healthy. Infinite mind is wealthy. Infinite mind is so-and-so. And pouring word after word after word into this one sitting there, getting all these words. And then the words came to my mind. If this man would only read the Bible and go back and read, who by his many words hopes to gain the ear of God. They hope to gain the ear of God by empty words that he himself does not believe. And the one who is paying him for that half hour does not believe either. Just empty words, driving it into someone who is so anxious about tomorrow's job or tomorrow's rent and sitting there all anxious. And this one, just words, empty words. Hasn't a thing to do with this simple approach to God. He's not out there, and he's not dead. You don't have to scream at him. And so he's just simply bawling out someone about God being infinite in power, infinite in health, and infinite in wealth. And she came out of that simply minus whatever she gave him, and there was not a thing from the words. It doesn't work that way. You sit down quietly, imagine the loveliest thing in this world, and say amen to that and then leave it. Now let us go into the silence. 